you decide to work together, I guess years before it actually happened, you know, as a, as uh, like boys, we started like creating all kinds of stuff together. And, uh, and yeah. Then, yeah, as we grew up, uh, I went to film school, Drew went to business school and uh, then I just proceeded to like hammer him like you got to join me like and uh, it didn't look good at first because I was making no money and Drew was making great money and uh, <laughs> uh, but eventually I warmed down and uh, and he jumped in yeah that was always kind of the plan John would go to film school I'd go to business school he would direct I would produce and that was always the idea and after college it took a, a few years for us to finally join forces but we did and we did a really tiny feature first before Poughkeepsie Tapes and then the Poughkeepsie Tapes was our second feature. It was my job to watch and log all 2,400 hours of the Poughkeepsie Tapes. In the first month alone, I couldn't sleep for more than an hour or two at night. I still have nightmares about them. By the time we write something down, we've hashed it out thoroughly together. Uh, we write together, I direct, Drew produces, and but it's a blurry line. Like we're both involved in every part of everything. Yeah, and it's you know it depends on the project. You know some. Um, some projects were more collaborative on the script than others, and this one being early in our career, I mean, we did a lot of research and, you know, we had the idea and we kind of mapped out what we want to do with it, but, you know, the first draft, John really just kind of holed himself up and cranked out a gigantically long first draft, yeah. <laughs> and then it became about, you know, shaping it and kind of moving things around and really uh, figuring out what the best narrative version of the story was, but uh, on that particular one, you know, back 12 years ago, that was... Uh, uh, you know, John deserves a lot of, you know, the credit on the on the script on that one. Uh, no, I mean, or yeah, a lot of we, blame, whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, yeah, that was a, it was a joint effort. It was a group effort. It was funny. We were uh, at lunch one day um, with uh, my brother-in-law Stephen Shabosky, who is also a director and and writer and a wonderful guy. And the three of us were talking, and uh, we we're talking about like what could be done in the like lower budget space but make it seem like a bigger budget and uh and we were kicking around ideas and after the lunch drew and i came home and we had this idea of what if we did a faux documentary on a serial killer's home movies and uh and both of us and we we're like we could call it the poughkeepsie tapes even though neither of us had ever been to poughkeepsie like we're, we called the poughkeepsie tapes and you know and then we just started riffing on it and we had we'd never done any horror like our our film had been a uh, comedy before that and then that's what we thought we were doing and we had this idea and we you know uh, from a directing standpoint I really had this like I, I don't know that I would have the the skill set to make a, an effective horror film as a as a filmmaker you know it's a you know I, I consider that a much harder thing to do than comedy um, you know comedy is a, you know a, a lot of you know single single two shot you know it's, it's more that that world whereas you know something with suspense and and uh we wanted to tell it in a mosaic kind of fashion we said you know what let's do it let's go for it and um i'm really glad we did yeah we, we grew up loving horror films but we never had completely thought of making our own and then when this idea came up it was like you know we had just made a comedy it, it was on the festival circuit it won some awards and it did well but it didn't get distribution and it didn't kind of take that next step and we thought you know what like horror films really you know when you make them for no money that's a genre that does have an opportunity to potentially break break free a little bit and uh, mm -hmm. and the idea wasn't that contrived necessarily it was just you know we've always loved horror films we're like that might be one that we can make for no money that could get us uh, noticed and could help us take a step in our career and uh, um, and then once we had the idea it was like okay I found footage faux documentary where we're portraying a serial killer like that's interesting in that you know you don't do that half-assed either if you're going to try to make it feel real you got to go for it and then we really got into the idea of of really pushing it on this one and um and you know we knew a lot of people would be offended by it or hate it or whatever and we just didn't care we said we're, if we're going to do it we're doing it and people if they're offended and you know you know, ban this movie, then then so be it. You know, and that was uh, yeah. a really fun kind of subversive uh, um, stage in our lives. Yeah, and like we we had a, like the things that do well are not the things that everyone kind of like gives it a five out of ten. Like we're like, let's make some that some people love, some people hate, yeah. and uh, and it was fun too. Like from you know like an economic standpoint, we had uh, 
we had been on the selection committee at Slam Dance, and we had you know gone through you know hundreds of movies and and watched you know just tons and tons of submissions, and we're like, okay, what seems like a big movie? And uh, and we said, okay, let's start the Poughkeepsie tapes with a helicopter you know shot of you know the Poughkeepsie Valley, and and you know to get that we uh, we actually rented a helicopter for like a hundred bucks, and we took the doors off it and just leaned out the door uh, with the camera <laughs> and uh, and uh, actually halfway through that shot I noticed the 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 DP like his you know in, in moving the camera had unclipped himself so he was not belted in like leaning out the door of this uh, helicopter and uh, we had a moment of like Sean you know and he froze up I took the camera and uh, um, it was like the, the lowest rent version of a helicopter shot I mean there was no stabilizer no yeah. head stabilizer or anything so you could actually in the shot, feel the th 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 in, yeah. and like we don't care, you know. You feel this Hudson Valley, this beautiful aerial shot, like anything that gives, uh, yeah, scope to something, you know, that makes it feel like more than just uh, this micro budget, yeah, um, is is helpful. Yeah, and then we shot the interviews all on film, and we shot the, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, the killers footage all on on video and and that helped us you know do a, a much lower budget thing um, that looked like it was intentional you know that that looked intentional. I had a tenant in this house here who was a very terrible person. This is the house where they found the Poughkeepsie tapes. It was a 15-day shoot, so it was really fast shoot. I think 13 of those were the uh, video, and then like two days of film. It was like we did all the talking heads in like two days. Just, yeah, at the just, end. Yeah, just rat a tat, rat it, you know, yeah. just as fast as we could. There were uh, like 12-page days or something. So yeah, it was. It served our small budget in a great way because so much of the real estate of the film was talking heads that we shot so quickly. So that that structure allowed us to make a 15-day film for mm -hmm. for that kind of money. Feelings. What do you mean? Like, like feelings like something's gonna happen or something. Why? It's weird. Everything's been so good lately. Like, everybody seems to be happy and everything's just like too good, you know? This is kind of before, you know, Cloverfield and quarantine and and that that whole, you know, next phase of found footage stuff. This was, you know, before the term found footage. Uh, and, you know, we'd seen Man Bites Dog, but that, that was more farcical. Uh, we'd seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, uh, but that was... Uh, that was bleak in a different way. You know, Poughkeepsie tapes can be a little bleak, but, you know, it... it uh, we wanted to do something different, you know, to us, you know, Thin Blue Line was a, a major touchstone for us. We, you know, we tried to, uh, with the talking heads and the, the evidence, we knew, you know, we really took a page out of their book. And there was a film called Tarnation that uh, was this, it really feels like you're going crazy as you watch this movie. And we said, okay, with Poughkeepsie Tapes, wouldn't it be cool if, like, as the audience is watching this movie, by the end of the movie, you feel like you've lost your mind? Like, it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And, and the way uh, Tarnation is edited is just so creative and jarring. And, you know, like John said, it kind of feels like you're losing your mind a little bit. And we're like, let's, let's very creatively edit this film so we give you that feeling that you're kind of slipping into madness over the course of the film. And, and on the tapes, I'd say the biggest... Uh, you know, influence, the most influential movie for us was Halloween. We grew up as big Halloween fans, and just seeing the camera from the killer's point of view and watching the potential victim is such a scary POV um, mm -hmm. that we just wanted to make, you know, th the horror element of the Poughkeepsie tapes just live in that world where you're stalking these people. And it's just, uh, you know, no one had done that before Halloween, and that really, uh, mm -hmm. that really spoke to us. A lot of it was just trying to carefully design mistakes, you know, so that the the film, you know, the, the camera's a little bit late to everything, uh, things are off frame a little bit, like, you know, it was fun playing with, you know, error as part of the, the tapestry of things where, you know, he's, and, you know, it, and it was interesting. We actually, the, you know, uh, Ben Mesmer, who plays the, the killer, 
uh, you know, we, you know, the cinematographer gave him a camera and walked him through like, okay, try and capture this if you can't like, but you know, it was a, it was a non camera man shooting most of that stuff. And, uh, and I think it feels more real as a result. And, and he does get more theatrical as he goes. We, you know, one of the things is how do you show him without seeing his face? And so we, you know, had the idea of the mask and, you know, to do that, uh, you know, it sort of lent itself to this theatricality, and and we, you know, kept pulling that thread. And we like to see his evolution too. Like he he's essentially a filmmaker himself, and to see his sense of of theatrics evolve over time, and the costumes get bigger, and um, we felt like that just showed his his, you know, growth as a filmmaker. I know that sounds <laughs> weird, but to show that you know evolution, but also show. Um, how much time and effort he put into what he was putting on screen. We felt like that was a very uh, creepy element of the character, and it gave the FBI, who was investigating him, you know, more intrigue and things to talk about and where does he get the, his, these inspirations, and, and uh, mm-hmm. it just gave us a lot to work with. Yeah, what, one of the things, uh, early on when we were just starting to write this, uh, we were talking with uh, Stacy Shabosky, who, who plays Cheryl and uh, is also my wife, and. Uh, she was saying, you know, the danger of this is this could be a very episodic sh- movie where it's like something happens, he kills someone. Something happens, he kills someone. And, you know, and it was her idea. You know, it was she was the first one to say, try to find a way to some character you can follow over the the course of the entire movie, and that became Cheryl Dempsey, which, ironically, then she ended up uh, uh, playing the role of. Uh, but you know, for us, the idea that we're seeing an evolution of people over time. And it's, you know, it, we kept saying, you know, amongst ourselves, like, this is a really twisted love story. You know, it's a, it's a, it's wrong and it's, you know, sort of Stockholm syndrome. And, but there is a love there. There is a, there is a, um, you know, kind of a twisted love, but it, you know, it's a, it has a little Romeo and Juliet, even though it's uh, really the, the kind of inverted, like, dark side of that. You are the master. Please take a service. Take a service. You are the master. Please take a service. You are the master. Please take a service. We rehearsed mostly on set, but yeah, we we'd run. You know, there was a lot of like really complicated sequences, and so yeah, we had to we rehearsed um, yeah as much as we could. Before we shot, we rehearsed. You know. Pretty much only with Stacy Shabowski and Ben Mesmer, we did some of their scenes, you know, oh, yeah, just because yeah. they were complicated and they were frightening, and they were, you know, there's scenes where Cheryl Dempsey's hogtied on a table, and we want to make sure when we get her into that position, it's uncomfortable, and we want to shoot her quickly. And so there's, you know, mm-hmm. some things like that that we didn't want to, you know, um, put the actress through more than we needed to. So. Mm-hmm. Some of that we rehearsed. A lot of these scenes, like there was no coverage. You know, it was like one shot, and um, and we didn't really do jump cuts or anything like that. You know, we we sort of played the shots in their entirety. Uh, so choreographing that stuff was really difficult. Uh, but then in editorial, uh, you know, actually that was kind of difficult too because there wasn't much to do besides just take stuff away. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know we didn't really. We didn't have many people working on this. There was just a small handful of people moving very quickly with no yeah. money, and uh, <laughs> Drew was the entire producing department. There was no <laughs> production manager or coordinator or p- even PAs. Like Drew was the guy, you know, getting lunches too. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was, it was a, it was a ragtag uh, operation to some extent, oh, and sure. uh, and it was exhausting but really thrilling. And we learned a lot of, you know, on the filmmaking and editing side, we learned a lot of tricks on that movie that has continued to serve us well um, yeah. now that we've gone on to do bigger budget stuff um, just you know the idea of where you can hide cuts and you know like for example we could only afford uh, four SWAT team uniforms but we wanted this house to be raided by 20 guys so you know we come in with four then we whip over here and hide a cut in that edit and the same four come in that door and then the same four come in the back door and mm-hmm. you know we did a lot of that kind of thing where uh, you know me not coming from a film school background or anything too I it was like exhilarating finding all these ways to cheat and 
and make it feel bigger than it is. And uh, and our next you know few features were all you know way bigger budgets than Poughkeepsie tapes, but always felt like they didn't have quite enough money. So we we're always trying to use these same tricks wherever we could to kind of increase the the scale. And um, yeah. so it was it was fun. It was yeah. I remember our uh, AD was like, "Well, you have a car crash written in this like." That's like a two-day scene. Like I was like, no, no, no. We'll just have someone in the back seat shaking a camera like this, and we'll do sound design. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, that's gonna look terrible. It's it like it'll be great. great. It'll, yeah. It feels great. Yeah. You know, it's it was, it was kind of fun. Like on that side, you know, you're because the you know you're with the killer's camera, you could cheat a lot of things, do things off camera. You know, there's a you know kind of a stunt with a kid, but it all happens off camera. The camera whips out of the way. And you hear things and you put it all together, but you're not actually doing any of that stuff. And, yeah. and so on that on that front, like, you know, we really thought everything through very, very carefully. And, uh, and even our own, like, visual effects, like the, oh, yeah. the Cheryl hand, you know, the, the moment where she rubs her head with the stump hand, you know, there's, we literally had, like, a green wall behind her and she had a green glove and she did that. And... And John did the whole yeah. visual effect, you know, himself. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I'm like, there's no way we're not going to need like a visual effects company to clean that up. And yeah. it looked great. And we actually sent it to a visual effects company, and they said, you know, we couldn't do any better than that. So yeah. I mean, every every thing was kind yeah. Of, we had no money, but we had time. <laughs> we had time exactly. I was like, I'm going to paint it out pixel by pixel. <laughs> if it takes me a month, I don't give a shit. You know. <laughs> That's one nice thing about doing something like totally off the grid and independently is there's no one waiting for it, which yeah. is both good and bad because you can spend forever in post. But yeah, but um, you can do things cheaply when your own time is free. Yeah. <laughs> he loved me. Nobody ever lets me say it, but it's true. He loved me. He didn't mean to leave me. And someday he's going to come back to me. And he's going to take me away. Well, Tribeca is where we premiered it. And, it uh, went great. It went great. We had lines around the block. And, and, uh, and you know, we screened. We didn't have agents or anything like that. And within a week of that first screening, we had signed at a, a, an agency and we had our, you know, and got a sale and got our first studio movie. Yeah, and like so MGM all, bought the movie. Yeah. Yeah, we signed at a major agency and yeah, had our first big studio film meeting that we later got. Um, yeah, so it was like quarantine. The, yeah, yeah, it was the kind of best week of our lives, the week after Tribeca and they, you know, we were the only film at the entire Tribeca Film Festival they added screenings for because demand was so so high. So we felt really great about it after Tribeca. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Numathon. But Numathon. Did not go as well. So. Yeah, you know, this was a, unfortunately, uh, we weren't, uh, they presented it, uh, uh, the presenters at But Numathon presented it as a real documentary, which we would have never signed off on. Yeah. And then the audience, I, I think, felt like, the filmmakers were trying to pull one over on them or something, and and it did, that went terribly. No, and it's a very obviously a very uh, smart film audience at Buttonamathon. These are real hardcore fans, and um, we got like the you know three a.m. slot. We were actually in the middle of shooting quarantine, so I went down alone because John was directing, and he, he couldn't take the chance of him not making it back. And uh, and it was just one of those nights. It was. You could tell a minute in. First of all, they presented it as a real documentary, which immediately my heart sank, and I knew that that wasn't going to go over well. And then within two minutes of the movie starting, it just it was going poorly, and it just got worse and worse. Um, and to exacerbate the problem, I think uh, MGM had forbidden us from doing any interviews about Bikesu before they released it because they didn't they didn't want to say it was real, but they didn't want to. They didn't want us to be on record as saying it definitively wasn't real either, and I, I can understand that. Our, our mindset was always to present it as fiction, and that people will still think it's kind of real, and that conversation will still exist, even if we say straight up that it's fiction. And it's too upsetting, like yeah. if it's real, I mean, like it's yeah. yeah, Blair Witch. Yeah. It's like it's a witch, you know. It's it's fine, you know. This is like, you know, your kids killer. being killed and stuff. Nobody wants to see that for real, you yeah. know. So we were like, no, no, you got to, like, come out. You know, we we felt it should be presented very clearly as, you know, a work of fiction. Yeah. But I do understand the marketing challenge that this film presented for yeah. the distributor. So 
that said, you know, they said absolutely no interviews, no Q and A's, no nothing. Um, and we told Badamathan that okay, we're, you know, I'm coming, but there's no Q and A. And then um, not only did they present as a documentary, but then said there was going to be Q and A after that we then that we couldn't do. And so the whole thing just was cursed. Yeah, yeah and then the story was uh, uh, filmmakers like, flee, flee, you know, theater, don't do like, a Q and A. It just went from bad it's to just, worse. And Drew had uh, pneumonia. Yeah, I stayed up all is, night. I came down with the flu, and I, I I came back to LA with pneumonia, and it was just. It was one of my just a most painful <laughs> memories, but I'm a time. We love yeah. Harriet and we love Drew McQueenie and all those guys, but um, and we still, you know, stay in touch and would do it again with another project. But um, that one was kind of the kiss of death for some reason. Yeah, and that was, you know, we were we were thankfully shooting uh, quarantine already, so we we were on our next movie, but. It was like having your heart ripped out and then showing up Monday to, to shoot, like direct yeah. and try to act like there's no problem. And then MGM, you know, not very long after, pulled the release of the film and, and Swart had nothing to do with Banamathon, but I'm sure that didn't help. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Like, we just had so much luck selling the film, getting an agent, getting a studio film. Like, everything was going so great. It was one of those very good life lessons. Like, you know what? Things can feel great and you can just get, you know, shivved at any moment and then <laughs> you know but then we still had quarantine coming out soon so we still had a lot to look forward to and it was just like okay th th that is essentially what a career in film feels like is you have great moments that are immediately followed by heartbreaking moments and then it turns around again and you just have to mm -hmm. you have to weather all of them and, and never you know never wallow in it and uh, it, it's, yeah it's true it's a uh, you know we were at a dinner a while back with a bunch of filmmakers and this producer sitting next to me, he's like, look around this room, like, these are the most resilient people in the world, yeah. like, you know, film it, like, because it is, you know, yeah, like you're saying, like, you know, we said early on, like, you know, success feels like a million little failures, yeah. you know, it's like, just, you know, it's just sort of a beat down a lot, yeah. and, uh, and, but there is, there's a joy to, to the challenge of it, and the game of it. And the fact, you know, in, in a way, the fact that they pulled it it's become this kind of underground thing that, you know, it, it, it's almost given it more uh, credibility in the fact that it wasn't released back then. And, yeah. and that's, it's sort of, you know, it's actually been good for the movie. It wasn't good for us to pull it necessarily, but it was, I think it was good for the movie. And, it, uh, it was. And we always felt that this movie played best to, you know, the type of audience who was given this DVD from a friend and said, you have to watch this and knew nothing about it. And, you know, the idea of like putting in 2000 theaters and it being this like big opening weekend, it was, it was bound to get a lot of people in who thought they were there to watch, you know, you know, just a regular horror film. And then they're going to see something that's so different. They, it'd be hard to make sense of it. And it would probably upset a lot of people. We always felt that it's the kind of movie that you hand off, horror fans hand off to other horror fans, and when they discover it in that way, they tend to really love it. And mm -hmm. um, I think this, you know, super delayed release might might give it that kind of perfect, um, you know, that perfect release for this movie. And uh, and I don't know that you know the world's changed so much where this movie plays any differently now than it did ten years ago. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it was, it was really fun to explore that space early on. Um, you know, the documentary style, you know, the challenge of shooting long oneers and to make it feel real in camera as opposed to uh, doing it all in post. Um, and, you know, we really had a good time. Like, quarantine was a really, you know, that was a fun challenge, a really... Mm -hmm. Uh, that was really exciting to go from like little indies where we're raising our own money and you know it's always like you know don't cash your checks till Wednesday you know it was like that <laughs> and uh, and then to go to a studio movie where that's just not that's not really your concern you know yeah. it's like okay now we get to just focus on making a film and uh, and get to go work at the Sony lot every day yeah. and build a four-story apartment building I mean, it was kind of stuff that was like 
you know, beyond our wildest dreams in, in one move from Poughkeepsie Tapes to quarantine. And that, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we definitely were aware of and concerned with the idea of getting kind of pigeonholed into this found footage, you know, world where, we're, you know, it'd be hard to. And we did have a bit of that. We'd go out for movies after quarantine. People were like, oh, they don't know how to do a regular movie. And it's like, well, yeah, we do. It's just, yeah. you know. That's easier. That's easier. <laughs> like, found footage is, is in a lot of ways harder. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we, we were very um, adamant about doing a non found footage movie quickly. And yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'd say Drew and I are really drawn to stories, whatever they are, and, and uh, that center on truth of some sort. Like, you know, uh, whether it's like, you know, faux documentaries or, you know, that kind of found footage is playing with the idea of truth and, and cinema and uh, trying to manufacture reality, which is a really fun challenge. And, you know, I think narratively, in, in a lot of ways, we, you know, we, we just keep coming back to themes of, you know, what separates truth from fiction mm -hmm. just over and over in our work. And stories that are, you know, experiential in a way where you really as an audience ask yourself what would I do in this situation and we've done that in our non found footage movies too we've really been gradu gravitating uh, to those kinds of stories but mm -hmm. you know found footage is such a, a, a blatant and direct example of that type of story. I remember uh, I think it was like day one or day two and there was a scene it was like the first scene with uh, the killer and and uh, and you know Ben Mesmer and Stacy Shabowski and and it was just so raw and real and like just a gut punch and you know Stacy and I were newly married and I'm watching her getting dunked in a water tank and it was horrible and I had like tears running down my face and and it's everyone on set that day I remember just going like oh my god we're making something great and uh and just everyone started showing up in a totally different way and that, that really so much of that came from the actors and the performances and just how deep they were and like yucky they were willing to go with this thing. <laughs> and uh, oh, another memory uh, was uh, there's a scene, a grave robbing scene, and uh, <laughs> shooting that scene, we actually had went to a real graveyard, had them bat co out a grave, put a coffin in it that we owned, and then we broke open the hood, the lid of the coffin. And then Stacy, the, the actress playing the role, she actually climbed down into the ground at night into a coffin in the ground with like dirt over her and like dirt would be going on her face and stuff and she's playing dead. And she actually climbed in that coffin for a couple shots and uh, pulled her out with a rope. Yeah. And then we pulled her out with a rope and it was like <laughs> one of those like, okay, honey, if, if you're down for this, <laughs> how would you feel about climbing down into that coffin in the graveyard in the dark? And, uh, <laughs> It was one of the creepiest things I've ever actually seen somebody do in real life, and uh, and she did. She's just such a pro. Yeah, we couldn't really afford stunt people. <laughs> <laughs> I have one funny memory from the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, actually. So our premiere, you know, it's in it's in uh, Battery Park, and it's you know 500 seat theater, and we come from a gigantic family, um, mm -hmm. and so we had probably 30 family members there, like uncles, aunts, cousins, the whole the whole nine. They want to support us on our first, you know. It was a film festival premiere, and uh, and all the distributors are there too, mind you. So this is like the, you know, all important screening that you know it's either going to get bought by Dimension or Lionsgate or whoever or not. And uh, and it's like ten minutes into the movie, and we're just seeing like people streaming down the down the aisles and leaving, and we're like, oh no, <laughs> and we're looking like, why are so many people leaving? They hate it, and then I. As they turn the corner and you can, they walk into the light, you can see their faces, and it was all, it was all of our family, it was all of our like <laughs> uncles and aunts and cousins. They're like, okay, we're here to support, but this isn't our thing, and we're leaving. And so, yeah, we we since banned them from ever coming to any premiere again. <laughs> <laughs> they made us look terrible. That yeah. a third of the audience left in the first ten minutes. <laughs> and they were all our like, people. Thanks, uh. thanks for the support. I'll tell you one place we'll be watching. If this documentary thing you're making ever gets to the theaters, he won't be able to help himself. He'll see this movie as many times as he can. We'll keep an eye on as many screenings as we can because he'll be there.
I think I honestly like I think if we were to make that film now, uh, we'd probably pump the brakes a little more. You know, there's there's, uh, <laughs> you know, we hadn't realized uh, maybe how, the the strength of certain imagery and and uh, and how that can just you know. It, you know, it, it can be a little overwhelming at moments. And I, I think now we we have a better sense of like how far to push things and, and when to hold back a little more. Um, you know, it, uh, you know I, I have a couple like young kids now and I, I, I frankly, I'm tamer, you know, like I, I don't necessarily know that I have the like punk rock like edge, like let's let's mess people up. You know, I, I, I think a part of that has been broken inside of me. <laughs> Though sometimes, uh, you know, I surprise myself. Like I mean, that. that movie was so a function of our age and mindset at the time, too. Yeah. That's true. And, you know, there's been times where, you know, other big horror distributors wanted to potentially buy it from MGM and wanted us to go back and do a new version of it and freshen it up, make it the cut that no one's ever seen. And, you know, so we thought about that very question of what we do differently in this. You know, it's hard to it's hard to look at it and say we would do much much differently. Like we mm-hmm. that movie completely changed our lives, and it just there's something about it that we felt really worked. And uh, you know, I don't yeah. know that there's any one thing that we would yeah. change. I think you know, yeah, I I think I'd be tempted to tame it down, yeah. and I don't know that that'd be the right thing to do for that movie. Yeah. I, I think part of part of what what I really appreciate about that movie is. It's just you know balls to the wall like it is this and uh, and there's no hesitation there and and uh, I appreciate that I, I don't know that I'd be that we'd be capable of doing that yeah. now and uh, I agree. Uh, you know I guess we'd do a very different version of it but uh, but yeah it's a, you know I, I really appreciate that it's there and that it's part of our history. Mm-hmm.